we, we are gonna answering the remaining part of the 10 questions about the refractive surgery and the cracunus. We have okay. answers about the first three. Just for reminding, the first one was for the bad, future, and the past. And you uh -huh. added module including the corneal biomechanical properties as one of the main factors in the new bad display for mm -hmm. training, right? Yes. Yeah, the second question about the flap thickness, and you said that it's very crucial to, to, to um, trying to get the thinner flap as we could to do, because it uh -huh. reduces the risk of the corneal weakening and getting more or less impact, less impact on the corneal biomechanics. Mm -hmm. The third one and the last, the hyperbic uh, correction, the post lasik TGA after hyperbic correction, and you said that this this is almost related to the uh, the thick flap, the deep cut, not the related cases to the ablation itself. Okay. Yeah, it's, so, it's going to be you know if you can have a keratoconus and weaken the cornea just with a cut, but the ablation probably the hyperopic ablation does not weaken too much. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, if we have a, a cracconus or a TG after hyperbic correction from the ablation, uh, you suggested that th this cornea was from frost cracconus. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, uh, the, the nomenclature about what it is is something we can debate, but it's, a, let's say, a susceptible cornea for for biomechanical decompensation. Yeah, okay. Uh, then the fifth question is, what's new about proved eye rubbing effects on the otherwise normal cornea? It's, it's a matter of the, or the subject of the campaign of the Violet June. So briefly, uh, briefly yes. if, you, if you can summarize that in a few minutes about the proved effects of the eye rubbing of the otherwise normal Cornea. Well, with pleasure. Yeah. Eye rubbing is, is a very bad habit. It's a very bad habit and we should teach the patients, we should educate the patients that eye rubbing is very bad. Eye rubbing is associated with aggravating keratoconus and with causing ectasia. Yeah. Those are not the same. Let's yeah. think. Uh, you can have a patient that has a very normal cornea to start with. And then that patient will rub the eye and then he will develop keratoconus or he'll develop ectasia, better say. Yeah. And eventually if that eye rubbing is only happening in one eye, this will be unilateral. And I'm gonna show you uh, examples about that in the, in the, in the talk, but it can aggravate actually keratoconus, and that's something that is very important for for us to understand. Yeah. So uh, eye rubbing is a very bad habit, and we should tell people not to do it. We have to tell patients about uh, also about the the need for um, for allergic to control of ocular surgery. Ocular surface optimization is also very, very much important. Yes. And all of this is part of the modern treatment of keratoconus. But the campaign goes beyond. Definitely, again, beyond but not over. Beyond but not over what? Beyond telling people not to rub the eye. It's not a campaign to tell people not to rub the eye. Yeah. The campaign is to tell people what is keratoconus how to deal with this, and eventually people should understand and take the opportunity with the knowledge to have better care. I have a lot of patients that suffer from the disease too much. Yes. And they suffer because of the misinformation, because of the lack of information. And we want to, to take care of the patient in such a way that they uh, with the understanding about the disease, they would be better treated. And that's going to be very important. Yes. Okay. This, yeah, okay. 
complete, sir, if you want to say some, something more. So, uh, uh, just a second. Yeah, okay, with you. I, I, I will summarize for, for the, the, the other uh, participants here what you said about the, uh, the, the eye rubbing that it may aggravate the crackiness if present as a disease. Please, please, for my, my, or my colleagues to mute your for, uh, microphones, please. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm muting all the microphones. Yeah, you are the host and you can do that. Yeah, okay, I will do it, do it now. Continue current and your participants will be muted. Then, then I will allow you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, okay. One point that is very important is that uh, we have seen the major work from my friend and my dear friend, Damian Gatineau, who is an exceptional colleague, his prolific collaborator, and has done many very good uh, things for ophthalmology today. And, but he, his point is that if you don't rub the eye, you never get keratoconus. He says it's sine qua non. And I agree, eye rubbing is very important, but... I highly disagree, that's the only factor. So it's like that, you can have ectasia because of a very weak cornea and that's kind of a genetic, or you can have ectasia because of the environment. And it's not one or the other, it's a combination. So telling people don't rub the eye and you never get keratoconus is a huge mistake. Yeah, okay. While it's a very good thing but, to tell people not to rub the eye. Okay, but we have to, to uh, divide uh, or to um, to correlate to uh, the coronavirus to the genetic issue of genetic uh, predisposition and the mechanical epigia due to the irapin if there is no genetic uh, pace for the coronavirus itself yeah we we don't have the genetic uh, test yet but we hope to have this soon and I see that on the near horizon there are some very interesting work by many companies and we have a commercial product done as a screening tool for keratoconus based on genetics. So this is something that we will start and we will have to understand how to use that data okay. uh, in our practices. Uh, and this may, may explain, this may explain the association between the, the variant keratoconjunctivitis and the, the ectegia. I, I don't, I, I will not, call it crackonus. I will call it ectegia until proving that this is a crackonus, which is a genetic disease. Uh, so uh, the old patients with, with allergy or with the vernal keratoconjunctivitis are prone for uh, getting ectegia if they are rubbing their eyes. Otherwise, yeah, if we yes. stop the rubbing, we will be, uh, uh, yeah, we, we will be safe and we'll be away from the ectegia. Right? Yeah, it's, it's probably a little more complex than only eye rubbing. Probably the inflammation on the ocular surface, the ocular surface disease itself may be associated with some metabolic pathways to weaken the cornea. So it's not the traumatic eye rubbing, but maybe related to other factors. There are some very good information about subclinical uh, inflammation and, and ectasia development, let's say. Okay, the last time in India, I was talking about the cross-linking cross -linking in children, especially those with vernal conjunctivitis disease. And I, I, I was uh, announcing about the, the violet John of Dr. Renato Ambrosio, but uh, I recommended uh, in that session that uh, it's essential uh, to think for uh, sending our patients with uh, with vernal keratoconjunctivitis for a pentacam to test the cornea with a pentacam, whatever the age. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, important. Are, to, are you supporting uh, this? Uh, this absolutely. Yeah or not? You, you know, you know, the pentacam is the is the gold standard tomographer with yeah. sign flu, but it's not the only machine. I think the patient, 
if you don't have a shine from tomographer, uh, you, you may do it with a placido disc topographer, or eventually you can monitor in the best way as possible. But telling people not to rub the eye and trying to treat the surface the best way as possible is going to be very important. And then the best management that you can get is to the best follow up with corneal imaging. Multimodal imaging includes placido, shine flu, go CT, biomechanical assessment. And of course, if I, I have seen a patient that is uh, 12 years old, uh, 11 years old, actually, a son of a friend of mine that has allergic conjunctivitis, and he was concerned about teratoconus. And yeah. his okay. and and he has a very thick coin. And I told him, you know, you have to treat your allergy, but prognostically you're not so so bad because you have a 600 micron cornea with a normal endothelium. Your biomechanics look good, but even though you should not rub your eye, and so it's good for the parents to understand that that cornea is not a very bad prognostics uh, in terms of ectasia development. However, the, the, the clinical care for treating allergy and telling him not to rub the eye will be with or without the, the data that I had for the imaging. But the imaging is, is reassuring because you can, you can tell people more emphatically you have more problem or you have less problem. So it's good. It's good to have the data. But okay. I, I tell people, do the best way as possible. Yeah, okay. You are recommending that now, even if there is no uh, query refraction for this, uh, this child, there is no high cylindrical error, and there is no uh, irregularities in the cornea uh, on the state lamp examination. If there is no uh, uh, one of these signs, you, you still recommend to do the pentacam to exclude. I recommend people not to rub the eye. And yeah, to do the best, now we the best for that. As possible. Yes, but the best treatment as possible. If the patient does not have a pentacam, you cannot do it. But if it's possible to do it, I think it's a very good indication to do it. Yeah, yeah. We are, we are paying all our attention now for this bad habit. And I, I, my, about myself, I'm spending a lot of time to learn my patient how to prevent, how to stop the rubbing of the eye. The, the child and the parents, and also uh, the the uh, our colleagues who are listening now, uh, uh, will we, we'll do that. But actually, uh, it's one of of the recommendation to ask for pentacam for all patients with severe allergy or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a question here. It's it's uh, it's an option or it's uh, highly recommended for all these patients. Yes, uh, it's recommended to everybody. You know, a lot of people come to the social media and ask me about eye rubbing. And the first thing I say, eye rubbing is very bad, regardless if you have a thin cornea or a thick cornea, a weak cornea or a strong cornea. Eye rubbing is always bad for you. And yeah. the, the point is that uh, I, I'm trying to, to share my screen here. Some, there, is, somehow. there is a technical problem? No, it's not. I think, can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I can yeah. see it now. Okay, good. Really so, yeah. okay. So, telling people not to rub the eye is always is always there is no way to go wrong with that. And but telling people that if you don't rub the eye, you never get ectasia, I think you are making a mistake. Uh, okay, because we 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 have uh, uh, another process for the ectasia. It's just not, it is not just the, the eye rubbing. As I told you before, it was in the, 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 in the, in the past reviewers and the textbook said that the rubbing of the eye is just a very mild predisposing factor, but nowadays it's not. It's more than to be a mild risk factor for EQG. It's one of the, yes. one of the main causes, especially uh, 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 in the entity of the mechanical EQG, not the coronavirus itself. You, we have to be careful with this because if you get a family of patients that have keratoconus yeah. and, you know, these patients may not need the eye rubbing as a factor. So you, you have to understand that people will have ectasia or keratoconus and those are the true keratoconus regardless of eye rubbing. So you have to be careful. Eye rubbing is very important and always tell people not to rub the eye. Because it will aggravate and accelerate the process, the pathologic process. Of but those are two different things. 
One thing is aggravate keratoconus, yeah. the other thing is to cause ectasia. If you understand those two different words, aggravate and cause, you yeah. understand my point. One thing is to get worse. The other thing is to cause. For example, we have COVID-19. Yes. It's caused by the virus. Yeah. But the social situation in Brazil is aggravated yeah. by the politicians who are doing a very bad work. So those are two different things. One is the cause, the other is the aggravation. Sometimes you don't need a virus and the aggravating factor can cause a problem that is even worse than the virus. You see what I mean? Yeah, okay. So this metaphor is a little bit uh, frustrating because that's how we are living in Brazil here. But this is, this is a very good, in my opinion, a very good explanation of aggravation and cause. Yeah, okay. I, I hope that the, 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 the polit politicians and the government there in Brazil are, are doing well to control and limit the pandemic of coronavirus, uh, as we are here now in Egypt. But we are waiting for John to start the violet, the violet June. I hope the, the, the world will be recovered from this pandemic. Yes, June is coming. Yeah. June is coming. So uh, I prepared this talk for you guys on redefinition of keratoconus from Frust. Yes. And this is something very important. Uh, yes. This is my financial disclosure, of course, with companies including Medifacos and Oculus. And my study group in Brazil, we know that keratoconus is a subspecialty. We know about keratoconus since the first work from John Nottingham. But refractive surgery lead us to the need of screening cases and also provide us tools to treat those patients. And we have paradigms. And one of the most important paradigms is when to treat. Interestingly, from Frust is not something exclusive from ophthalmology. French means crude or unfinished. And it's the opposite of the form plain. And frustra also would be mistaken or confused. So I think we are many times very confused and mistaken on what is form frust keratoconus. There are form frust situations in medicine, including the work from Sigmund Freud that form frust will be an incomplete case of a neurosis or psychosis. And this is important that Mark Kemsler is acknowledged because in the late 30s, he started to call form frust keratoconus on some clinical issues on Javal and later on photokeratoscopy that would demonstrate patients in very mild, in long-term studies that would develop the plain disease. So form frust may develop the disease, the plain or not. So the keratoconus frust, sometimes the unilateral presentation, the unilateral case would get a disease, a clinical disease. And this is something he saw in longitudinal studies. So these patients that were follow-up over time, here four or five years of follow-up would demonstrate how form frust would develop. And eventually, if you are sensitive to understand the placido disc photokeratoscopy, before computer was available for the computer maps, computerized color code maps that we are available, we can eventually, in a very laborious way, to look at the details on the corneal curvature that would preclude the clinical keratoconus. And then we had topography, computerized corneal topography, and this is a very good uh, addition on the JRS. Actually, the Journal of Refractive Surgery in 1989 was called Refractive and Corneal Surgery. And this journal is a classic. And I would advise you all to go to the library and try to get a copy of these papers, starting from the editorial that was done by my professor, Steve Wilson, under the supervision of Steve Kleiss and Herb Kaufman. In that issue, is the classic computer topography in keratoconus from McDonnell and Rabinovitz. So he has his described the patterns of irregularity with stiffness, inferior, inferior stiffness, central corneal stiffness, asymmetry between the eyes. And Yaron Rabinovitz start his 
categoric definition of keratoconus, the obvious keratoconus, the early keratoconus in which you have slit lamp findings and typical topography, but it was not on slit lamp. And you have topography abnormal, but you have abnormality on optics, which is something he detects with a retroillumination. The foam fruits is when you have no slit lamp and typical topography. So he calls typical topography with no slit lamp and still with good optics. Let's say a patient has good vision. It's not easy to understand, even though it's something that he says foam fruits is when you have typical irregular uh, uh, corneal topography. And the suspect is when you have a typical topography that is not enough abnormal to call a typical KC topography. This will be a case that Yaron would say, this is a foam fruit. The patient is 20, 20, 21 years old, and he has irregular astigmatism. Inferior stiffening is a steep cornea, and the patient is, with a 20, 20 in slit lamp biomicroscopically normal, a foam fruit. However, the fellow eye of this patient, I will show you, it's the one that I call foam fruit. We don't need to wait until the patient has all the biomicroscopy bi signs of the disease to call keratoconus. We need early detection, and topography is very much important. We know that topography would help us identify what is foam fruit in cases that can be at risk for progressive keratectasia, as Bill Seiler described in 1998. It's important that in one of the most used methods for ectasia prevention, you have FFKC as a pattern of topography, as described by Brad Random. Also, age is important here. But if you go to the classification based on the subjective interpretation of methods by experts, you have a huge variability. So from 1 to 25, these cases were sent to colleagues, all experts in topography with two scales, and they vary themselves with the two scales and the variability is significant. So one of the things is that Steve Kleiss and, and others, they developed the methods for interpretation. But we need to understand that inter interpreting corneal topography is not the only factor. And even though Schauhorn, in his very good study on ectasia risk in a very large population, he saw foam fruit as the most important risk factor with the odds ratio of 20.7, which is much more important than age or other factors. And if you combine age, you can get foam fruits and age as the most important risk factor. And again, age comes here because age is a surrogate of biomechanics. However, the main thing is that you can have ectasia with a normal tomography, and you can have a stable outcome with abnormal tomography. And even though it's not a fruit, it's not a suspicious, it's abnormal. And I'll show you some more cases of that. So, the abnormality on corneal topography, the conundrum is because some of these cases may be a good candidates for LASIK. And the computer may be identifying a pattern of irregularity that's not enough for keratoconus, but you can see KCS. This is a patient from an international cohort of, of patients that I follow over time. And with more than 10 years of follow-up, actually 12 years of follow-up, uh, I still talk to the surgeon who did the surgery. The patient had LASIK and is stable. And both eyes retrospectively, in that time we didn't have the Ds, we would have a normal D. So the tomography will give you an enhanced specificity if you want to say that this patient would be a good candidate for LASIK. However, I would say that this is not always correct. But it makes the point that there are ectasia with no recognizable risk factors, and there are cases with risk factors that are stable with good outcomes. So they need to go beyond. And the fellow eye of that patient with 2015 is a perfect example in which the sensitivity of topography is observed in the right eye, but everything is normal in the left eye. So this is asymmetric, this is a fact. And some people would come with the opinion 
that I would believe that is incorrect, that this is unilateral. And we will come to unilaterality in a second. So von Frust evolved from Amsler to Kreschmer, which is the best definition for me. It's mild disease is mild disease is form Frust. The fellow eye of asymmetric patients would be referred as form Frust by Kleist. This is also a very good publication from the British Journal in 2009. The cornea can have ectasia because of two factors, the resistance and the impact from the environment. And again, laser vision correction causes a huge impact, but it's not the only impact. And eye rubbing is a major factor. Any cornea may develop ectasia, and that's the scope of the viral June. To tell people that keratoconus may be aggravated by eye rubbing, or even ectasia to be caused by eye rubbing, but also misinformation and lack of understanding about the disease may be even worse for the patient than the disease. So we have to tell patient about keratoconus, how to treat it, what to expect, how to understand why you need surgery, why you don't need surgery. This is a very important part our, of our medical profession. So the quest for enhanced diagnosia uh, of keratoconus is related to refractive surgery. The paradigm shift on ectasia management is also very important because the paradoxes on the treatment is they, they should be understood by the physician and by the patient so that we understand when to treat based on the diagnosis and prognosis and the follow-up. So the major concept is that form frust is not a pattern of irregular topography or even tomography. Form frust, in my opinion, is a susceptible cornea for biomechanical decompensation. And we have surrogates, including age, including irregularity on the front surface, abnormal tomography, segmental tomography with epithelial thickness, especially with the ultrasound and OCT that is popular, has popularized the ability to see the epithelium, biomechanical assessment, cornea wave front. And in the future, we believe that biomechanical uh, will evolve to genetic understanding and eventually molecular biology tests. So we need biomechanics. Biomechanics is part of the multimodal imaging that is going to be important for everything we do in treatment. Refraction should be guided by wavefront. Contact lens can be improved by shape of the cornea and wavefront. Customized surgical planning. You have custom cross-linking, you have corneal ring segments. All this, you can do the follow-up better with the data from multimodal imaging. And of course, seeing patients with complex situations and complications, this data will be more important. All this study that we have done in Rio de Janeiro since uh, 15 years ago is related to the combination of factors. So the basic thing is to combine data. And today we are able to combine data from tomography and from biomechanics using artificial intelligence. And we included the 96 cases with normal topography from patients that have ectasia in the fellow eye. And we call those cases very asymmetric ectasia. And they are normal topography patterns based on objective criteria. But some of them are pretty much suspicious or eventually abnormal. Artificial intelligence is very important for our world today, and it's critical for us to use the clinical data from multimodal imaging. And the leave one out cross-validation random forest method enable us to improve the ability to use the data with the tomography and biomechanical index, or the TBI, which is much superior to separate even the clinical cases from the CBI alone and from the bad D. The bad DI is pretty much the same as the bad D, but with a sigmoidal transform so that you have a number that will come from zero to one instead of having negative and very positive values as in the standard bad D. So the understanding that the biomechanical and in tomography integration will give us an enhanced ability to detect clinical ectasia and to improve the detection in cases with mild conditions is important, but 
we don't have it positive for all cases. And here we have two hypotheses. One, this is a patient that even the TBI, the integrated parameter, is not sensitive to detect abnormality here. However, I do believe that some of these cases are truly asymmetric and unilateral ectasia cases. However, my understanding today is that it's not one or the other. It's a surrogate of the biomechanical resiliency of the cornea so that this factor will give us the understanding if the cornea is or is not resistant for the biomechanical impact of the environment. We need external validations. We use the leave one out cross validation, which is very robust, but the leave one out cross validation, uh, it, it excludes one case, you do a model and you test in that one. And you do that every time uh, for every patient, that you, for every subject that you have in your sample. Even though you need to have external validations, even though the model is very robust with the leave one out cross validation and clinical implementation to improve it. One of the first papers that came out was from my colleague, George Waring IV, done by George Haddad, who was doing his fellowship in, in the United States with him. And he presented cases like this one with a relatively normal topography. You see some inferior steepening, but not a very steep cornea. And the fellow eye is a considered from Fruz based on Habinovitz situation. So it's a 2025 or better this is correct vision, and you see abnormality in the TBI. This uh, was followed by many other studies from India, from Iran, from Germany, from Japan, from Brazil. And here we have some, of, some cases that were reported with a low TBI in the ectatic eye. And this is something we have to understand how to interpret this case, because some of these cases may truly be the ectatic cases that are not so weak to start with. And eventually, if you look at the shape of this corneas, you may see some abnormalities and some things to consider. We have our series of external validation in Rio and some cases that I think totally came as very interesting. So these twin sisters, one twin sister is a very symmetric case and the fellow twin, 